Hey everyone, it's Saoirse. I've got a good one for you today. I want to talk to you about another short story collection. This one is another George Saunders collection. It is his first, actually. Civil Warland in Bad Decline. Woo, stumbled through that. Civil Warland in Bad Decline. So it's six stories and one novella. This was published in 1996, and I loved the author's note that's at the end because he talks about how this is his first book and it was written while he was working in an office writing reports about groundwater contamination and other equally boring things um, and he would write this you know take time here and there and, and write a little bit of it and it just it was a wonderful story reading about how this came about and it's really inspiring so um, I will explain why I'm wearing this little Mickey Mouse and my Festival of Fantasy Parade cast and crew jacket with my name on it. So I worked at Disney for seven years until the pandemic laid everybody off, or most of us off. Um, and this book is so interesting to me because so many of the stories maybe like half the stories take place in and around the world of theme parks. I love it. So I read his books in, I think, the like backwards order. 10th of December, Pastoralia, this one, um, and this was first. So it was interesting to see his style change backwards. Um, and he talks about how he, he uses theme parks because, uh, why did he say he uses theme parks? It's like, it's, it's a device in writing to get you to not be too depressing. Like, it's, it's going to bring an element of the absurd to it. And the absurd is something that George Saunders does, um, like an expert. Oh yeah, real quick. I'll show you my name tags. I broke the frame that these are in, but... Here's my little, I only got a, a one year pin and I should have had a five year pin as well, but I changed status a couple times. And there's my one from Disneyland Paris, that didn't last long. Um, yeah, I miss it, I miss it a lot, but it is so interesting to read theme park based fiction. I could write, I could write some stories and I have, and I will, um, but this is just so good. It's so good and so creepy and weird, and let's get into some examples of how he uses the absurd to comment on everyday evils, on things that we, like, we kind of all experience. It's just, it, there's a lot of bad times in, in his stories, interestingly. Um, in this first one, Civil War Land and Bad Decline, um, the titular story. There's um, this character who works at a theme park, Civil War Land. It's like a kind of self explanatory. And he sees these ghosts. And normally I'm not here for ghosts, but the way that George Saunders does this, he's so masterful. And he just comes in and he's like, ghosts. And here's what's going on. And you're just like, oh, okay. I believe you and I understand what you're doing and I'm here for it. Um, which is really, really talented because I would typically see Ghost and I'd be like, I'm done. Um, okay, so the character sees this ghost. He came back from the war and a year later died in his cornfield, which is now parking. So he spends most of his time out there calling the cars Beelzebubs and kicking their tires. So you just, you can picture this this guy who made it through the Civil War and then died and then his cornfield is turned into this parking lot for a theme park that, I don't know what the right word is, not exploits maybe, um, the events of the Civil War, which is something that surely gave this ghost PTSD and it's just, oh, it's such a sad and ridiculous image, and that is what he's great at, sad and ridiculous images. Let's look at a few more. He's just so good at 
at really specific details, like this one in uh, The Wavemaker Falters. My counselor is Mr. Poppet, a gracious and devout man who's always tightening his butt cheeks when he thinks no one's looking. That is just this great, absurd, but believable detail. Um, and he uses these details to really add reality to the stories, to crazy stories. Like, he usually writes things that, I don't know if it's usually, but from what I can remember, they're usually things that could happen. They're ridiculous. And they, maybe they seem ridiculous until you think about, oh, this actually is how life is. And we're just not used to reading fiction that reflects the weirdest parts of life. Um, and that's what he's doing. He's reflecting it back to us and making us go, oh, I'm, not, I'm uncomfortable. Um, this is too real. It's so real, it feels ridiculous because we just aren't used to reading that. Um, what was I saying? So yeah, sometimes he uses... Um, what are ghosts? They're paranormal. Um, or th things that couldn't happen. But most of the time it feels very like dystopian sci-fi, kind of. Um, and all these theme parks, you know, places that kind of already do exist. And like, trust me, I... I have no shortage of, of wacky, wild, unbelievable stories and memories from working at Walt Disney World for so long. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate this. I just totally lost my train of thought, like, completely. Okay. So here's an example of, like, some of the quick, simple details that he uses. And this is in the... And the wave maker falters still. Looking sheepish, he steps over and puts the gun to my head. The sound of our home's internal ventilation system is suddenly wondrous. The mole on his cheek possesses grace. Children would have been nice. Just these three little details to... Without... This is like a Chuck Palahniuk thing from when I did that video talking about um, his lessons on writing. He's really showing us, rather than telling us, um, that this person doesn't want to die. And rather than saying, like, oh, I'm so scared to die and I'm, I really want to live, he tells us children would have been nice. Oh, it's just so good. Um, I wrote, these quick, simple details give you clear, crisp, connotations. Clear, crisp connotations. It's just very easy to picture what he's saying um, and relate it to the story. Oh, sorry, there's some horrible children um, who like to kind of torture this cat and I might have to go yell at them. Okay. Let's see, more details. Um, in this case, using them to make the reader sympathetic. I can't think of anything to say, so I nod. Then I retreat, moist-eyed, to my cubicle for some invoicing fun. I'm not a bad guy. If only I could stop hoping. If only I could say to my heart, give up, be alone forever. There's always opera. There's angel food cake and neighborhood children caroling and the look of autumn leaves on a wet roof. But no. My heart's some kind of idiotic fishing bobber. My invoices go very well. The sun sinks, the moon rises, round and pale as my stupid face. That's from the 400 pound CEO, and that's after this character's gotten rejected. I just think those details are so perfect. Perfect, perfect. You know, he's not just saying, feel bad for this guy, he's been rejected. Um, you know, how's he gonna go on and and find meaning in life when he knows he's going to be alone forever. Angel food cake, neighborhood children caroling. It's just, it's just good stuff. And the thing is, he uses a lot of characters that are underdogs. And here's another, another example of that. I mean, it is 
consistent. Like, the characters are usually down on their luck men. Um, not always, but usually that. Um, men who are just kind of ineffectual and don't hold much power in their lives or at work. Um, yeah, so here's one from Offloading for Mrs. Schwartz. This one is incredible. So it's this guy, he works at a sort of virtual reality place where you can like go into the, you can, it's, it's virtual reality. Um, I doff my headset and dismount the treadmill. Once again, it's just me and my failing shop. Once again, the air reeks of microwaved popcorn. Once again, I am only who I am. I love that, um, because that's a consistent thing in his stories that, oh, my neck hurts. That these underdog characters, they're, they're usually hopeful, but they're so depressed. Um, and they're always trying to be something more than what they are or, or what the world sees them as. And using this virtual reality in this story, he gets to escape that a little bit, but then at the end of the day, he's always just who he is. And you can't escape that. Um, okay, let's skip ahead. Ooh, we're really skipping ahead. Okay, this is from Bounty, and this is the novella. And this one's hardcore, like, starts off in a theme park. This is just an example of George Saunders' style that I think comes through. It comes through a little bit here, and then it's it like explodes in his later works. This way of characters talking that is just strange. Artie, sweet Jesus, why refer to our people as prostitutes? The father says, that's not a fun term. That's not a term that makes people want to let their hair down. That's a sad term. That's a term that, if anything, makes people want to put their hair back up, which means I eventually close up shop and you hustle your ass home from college sans degree. Sheesh. My son, the philosophical sourpuss, looks down his nose at my line of work but sucks up the tuition like it's going out of style. Okay, so... I don't know if you can, like, hear it from me reading it, but... The way he's like, that's a term that, if anything, makes people want to put their hair back up. Just this kind of, like weird, stilted, logical, over-explaining in a way that, like, people don't normally talk, um, and it makes it a little bit more absurd. He does this way more in his later stories, but I just, I noticed that and I was like, oh, this really feels like George Saunders. Um, okay, and then moving on to the author's note, there's so many great bits in here. He said that at this point in his life when he was going to start this book, all of his work was like trying to imitate Hemingway and it was really suffering for that because any kind of imitation you're, you're not going to use like what you're actually good at and he gets into that. So he, he tells us about this story that he wrote, um, Ed's Wedding. It is the story of a wedding, Ed's wedding to be exact, that takes place in Mexico. Lots of people come to the wedding and are described in Joycean, Lowry-esque prose, which in my hands meant as few verbs as possible, so as to ensure that nothing appeared to be happening. And if something inadvertently did happen, it didn't happen with any clarity. To make up for the scarcity of verbs, I utilized lots of compound words. There was no drama at the wedding except that my friend got married, and the novel reflects this. The novel was 700 pages. He never published this. Um, but I just, I love that about, like, we have to make sure nothing actually happens in this book. Okay, if something happens, I gotta change things. I, I just think, you know, coming from a academic background in terms of creative writing, we kind of revere, um, why can I not think of anything. Um, oh my god, literature, literature. This is humiliating, but I'm not editing this. <sighs> the kind of literature that isn't a genre, 
Oh my god. Okay, I can't remember the term right now. That is really crazy. But, so you have genre fiction, like, you have um, sci-fi and fantasy and horror. I'm waiting to see if it comes to me. It's not what in the world. Okay, but anyway, we look at these things that are not genre fiction and we kind of like put that on a pedestal. And so like that's what he was doing and um, it sometimes results in terrible 700 pages, 700 page novels where nothing happens at all. Okay. Um, and then he goes on to say, like, he, he realizes that he could use the things that he's good at in writing and it'll make the writing better. Suddenly, it was as if I'd been getting my ass kicked in an alley somewhere and realized I'd had one arm behind my back. All of my natural abilities, I saw, had been placed by me behind a sort of scrim. Among these were humor, speed, the scatological irreverence, compression, naughtiness. All I had to do was tear down the scrim and allow these, those abilities to come to the table, and writing might be fun again. Um, that was the day I started this book, essentially. So, there you go. Finally, like, letting himself get out of, um, this box that he'd put himself in where he felt like he had to be this Hemingway-esque writer. Yeah, and when you start being true to yourself and stop imitating so much, magical things can happen. Um, and then there's this great part where he says somebody had, somebody he knew read this book and he said, did you like it? And she said, no, it worried me. I'm worried about you. You seem like a very unhappy person. Like the guy who takes out the garbage late at night, miserable and grumbling. I didn't quite know what to say to this and waited for some sort of softening praise of the, but still, wow, you published a book variety. But no, I'm worried, she said. That book is not like you. You were always such a happy little guy. Wait a minute. I thought once she'd hung up, I am happy. I'm one of the happiest people I know. My book is not unhappy. My book is funny. My book tells uh, dark truths. I'm a hopeful person. Writing this book was a happy, hopeful act. I just think that's great because you don't know how people are going to take what you write. But also, happy people can write hopeless books and cannot sometimes not even realize how hopeless they seem because from, from their eyes they think it's funny or absurd. Um, but it, depending on the mood you're in, if you read these stories and you're in a bad place, they're very depressing. If you're in a bit of a silly place, they're fun and like just make you go, oh, the world sucks, doesn't it? Ha <laughs> ha. But then you move on. So it's just really interesting. Um, as I love to say, no story becomes what it is until it is filtered through the lens of the reader who's reading it. Then it becomes something for them and is given its real life. And that real life of that work is going to be different for every single person. Why can I still not think of this term? I'm going to write it in the... Description. I can't believe myself. My brain is going blank. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there and recommend. I think 10th of December is definitely my favorite of his collections, but I liked this one and I will continue to read more George Saunders. I think there are some other things out there. Um, specifically, Lincoln and the Bardo is a novel that he wrote. And I don't have it yet, so I would like to get that one. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Tell me about the absurd things you like to read, and I will see you all next time.